You're known for focusing a lot on realism in the effects that you do. Mm -hmm. And um, there's two projects, obviously I could talk about a lot of stuff that you've done, but there's two really different projects that, are, that required that very attention to detail and realism approach. Totally different things. Uh, you've got the pseudopod in the abyss, which mm -hmm. is a completely fictional fantasy creature, which is, you know, I can get into the whole story and say it's not a creature at all, but you know, but that, mm -hmm. but that existence, that, that thing was something as, no one's ever seen that before, it's never existed. And then you've got in uh, Magnificent Desolation, you did the mm -hmm. Apollo 15 moon yeah. landing. So I want to talk about the abyss first, just because uh, it was so groundbreaking. Um, talk about what you had to do on set before you even mm -hmm. got to CG. Mm -hmm. Well, this was uh, an interesting project because it was also new. You know, we had never done anything really quite like that before. There's the stained glass man in Sherlock Holmes, uh, but uh, that was a different group. That was the, the, the group that uh, ended up going off and becoming Pixar. So uh, this was the, the new ILM computer graphics department. and. Nobody had any real experience um, doing this sort of work. Uh, we talked about uh, what were the things that were likely to be needed on set. You know, we're going to have to figure out uh, um, where the camera was when we shoot the plates. So I, I got uh, I was just making it up. I thought, well, I'm going to start with uh, and talk to production designer about getting blueprints of the set. And I'll have Xerox copies of the the blueprints, and I'm just going to take measurements and. Uh, you know, relative to set pieces, and that's how we're going to figure this all out. So I went as the match mover. Uh, I brought a still camera, and I thought, well, the, the pod is uh, reflective and refractive, so it's going to be seeing parts of the set that aren't on camera everywhere. So I'm going to bring a camera, and I'm going to shoot everything uh, to make an environment for the, the pod to reflect. And <laughs> um, and we're actually already in development on, on Photoshop, uh, and so we were you know, well underway with, uh, with the product. And, and uh, I got all the, the scans back, and, and I actually manually stitched together the reflection environments uh, for that. Um, and there, you know, there wasn't any real procedure for, for doing this stuff. It was just kind of making it up as you, as you go along. It became apparent that we were going to have to put faces on the ends of the pods. Uh, we got, uh, we, let's see, I, I worked out a, a technique to animate the, the faces by getting cyberware scans of our, our actors in a whole variety of poses. So you're talking about the morphing between those yeah. expressions. And then uh, took those data sets and uh, Doug Smythe had written this uh, morph program for Willow and uh, he modified it so that we could uh, morph between cyberware data sets. Right, and that led to the Terminator, to the stuff that was used in Terminator 2? Uh, yeah, only sort of. I mean, it was for the same director. Um, and uh, Jim had said that, that doing this pseudopod was a bit of an experiment and one that uh, if it didn't work, he, he could have cut that whole bit out of the film and that the story would have still made sense. But then when the, the success of that uh, encouraged him to be a little bolder with Terminator 2 when he wrote that into the script. It just had to work. and uh, So he forged ahead with some confidence that, that we'd be able to make that work. Now the other, the other project that I mentioned was uh, Magnificent Desolation, which mm -hmm. not a lot of people have seen comparatively to the mm -hmm. other bigger films, but he spent a lot of energy and time on really matching the, the trajectories and the feel of, of what, what these astronauts were going through when they landed. Because I think it's mm -hmm. I think it's the kind of thing that people don't pay a lot of attention to. They, you know, they think when doing visual effects, you don't need to be realistic. You don't need to. Be, you can go, you know, kaboom. And oh, I, I think the the reality is cooler than the fiction in a, in a lot of cases. I, I grew up uh, in the, the late '60s and early '70s in the the height of the Apollo program, and it had a huge impact on me as a kid. And to say that that all the years that have passed since those uh, those missions that nobody's ever made a really serious attempt to show what they looked like. And uh, in 1999, uh, during the, uh, the 30th anniversary of uh, the Apollo 11 landing, uh, I stumbled across a thing called the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. And it's a website that had 
uh, annotated time, time stamp transcripts of all the air to ground communication uh, during the, the missions. So I got this very, very different impression reading that than, uh, than, than what I felt had been depicted in the, the documentaries. And then one thing that was great was they had some uh, telemetry graphs that were hyperlinked in uh, to the annotations. And, and you know, being an old motion control guy, you, know, you look at this uh, uh, vehicle pitch over time, and you know, I can't help but start to sort of imagine sees for a pitch like this, and then this represents it pitching back. And, and uh, I'm already kind of starting to visualize the, the motion. And so I started a little project uh, where I was going to try and recreate the Apollo 11 landing uh, like as technically accurate as I could make it. And uh, I've got a first version of it done, kind of in, in mostly animatic form. And uh, I, I spoke at a, at a VES function in uh, the uh, summer of uh, 2004 uh, where I talked about uh, scientific accuracy in, in movies and, and I, I showed this Apollo 11 landing thing as a work in progress. And after that, I got uh, approached by a producer uh, on Magnificent Desolation, who was in the audience at the time, and, and he said, wow, I, I need exactly what you've done here, but I need this in IMAX. And, and you know, we should talk. And, and, uh, and so, you know, we continued to, to talk, and I ended up uh, helping out with, uh, with some, about 20 or so shots on this, this uh, IMAX stereo project. And I cared about getting it right. I wanted to make sure the, that the motion of the vehicle was correct, that the, that the trains were correct, that the, uh, that the, the lighting and, and all the dynamics were as, as accurate as I could make them, because I, it makes a difference to me.